Okay, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Um, just want to say thank you for joining us all today. Um, for those of you who don't know me already, I'm Jordan Money. I'm the Assistant Director of Events and Communications for uh, CSS and SSP. Um, I'm really excited to kick off our summer virtual speaker series. This is something we've been talking about trying out for a while now, and it's really great to see, you know, a dozen of you, maybe more joining throughout the evening, um, showing up and showing your support for that and being interested in it. Um, a couple of quick notes before I introduce our speaker. Um, your microphone is muted by default. Um, please leave it muted unless you have a question at the end um, so that we don't have any background noise while our speaker is talking. Um, when we get to the Q&A section, I will be moderating questions. You can send those questions directly to me through the chat, you can send them to the group chat um, throughout the event, um, and I will hang on to them until the very end, or you can wait until the end and ask them yourself, in which case um, we'll be using the raise hand option, which I'll explain when we get there. Um, we are recording this session today, and we'll make it available on YouTube later for anybody who isn't able to watch it right now. Um, keep that in mind if, you know, for some reason you ask a question that um, you wouldn't want recorded although I can't imagine, hopefully, what that would be. Um, finally, as I noted, this is our first Zoom-only session that we are doing, um, so please bear with us if there are any hiccups along the way. With all of that said, it is my pleasure to introduce John Cullen, who has more than three decades of experience in law enforcement, counterintelligence, and homeland security. He's currently a senior intel and threat expert for the Argonne National Laboratory, as well as director of the Center for Critical Intelligence Studies at Rutgers. Previously, he was at DHS as the Counterterrorism Coordinator and Acting Undersecretary for Intel and Analysis. He's also worked in the ODNI, as well as in many other incredible roles that would take far more time to list than we have right now. Um, for those of you who are students currently and are still sorting out your fall schedule, he's also joining us as a new adjunct faculty member, which we are very excited about. Um, he will be teaching a course on emerging issues in Homeland Security and domestic intelligence, which does still have some seats available. Um, John, thank you for making time to speak with us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jordan, and uh, my thanks to CSS and SSP for pulling this together today. Um, it's nice to be with all of you this afternoon, uh, and I hope all of you are looking forward to a, a pleasant summer. Uh, what I would like to begin discussing with all of you today, uh, broadly, uh, is the issue of how social media and other uh, emerging online communication tools are being leveraged by a variety of threat actors facing the United States today. Uh, whether it is foreign nation states, uh, non-government or non-state actors such as terrorist organizations or transnational crime groups. But the bottom line is the, the U.S. is facing a dynamic and evolving threat environment. Uh, and countering this dynamic and evolving threat environment uh, requires a hybrid or adaptive approach, which uh, I'll discuss a little bit, uh, a little further on in the presentation. You know, the sources of information that I'm going to be using to provide information to y'all today uh, comes primarily from work that I began uh, while I was in the intelligence community, working for the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, work that we continued while I served at the Department of Homeland Security, and after leaving uh, DHS in late 2014, I've been involved in a, uh, an international project working with the FBI, uh, law enforcement organizations from the Euro US and Europe, mental health professionals, intelligence officials, to really look at and understand the evolving nature of, of threats facing the US and developing uh, frameworks for how we could counter those threats, whether it be the threat posed by international terrorist organizations, uh, domestic extremist groups, uh, and foreign intelligence services. Uh, for the purposes of this discussion today, I'm going to talk a little bit, bro I'm going to talk broadly for a bit about the, um, the, the threat environment as it's evolving uh, through the use of these technologies I referenced, but I'm going to really zero in on two use cases and discuss the threat of mass casualty attacks uh, in the United States and then the use of social media and other online tools and cyber attack techniques by foreign intelligence services, in particular the Russian 
uh, services uh, as they seek to achieve their intelligence objectives and engage in active measures targeting the United States. So we're going to talk a little broadly and talk about this at a high level, but then we're going to get into the weeds a little bit uh, on two specific threat vectors. Uh, it's fitting, you know, as I, as I thought about this presentation, um, I feel somewhat fitting uh, that we're having it during the week uh, where we are um, acknowledging the anniversary of D-Day, the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Because D-Day and World War II, uh, during that time period, the projection of power and a critical way in which nation states in particular projected um, power uh, or sought to achieve their geopolitical objectives included the use or involved primarily the use or the threat of use of armed conflict. Uh, whether it was conventional armed conflict or as we uh, evolved past uh, the Second World War into the 50s and 60s, uh, the projection of force through the uh, potential use of nuclear weapons. But it was really in the military environment, whether it was our, within our own Department of Defense uh, or within NATO, uh, that there became growing concerns that as technology was expanding and, and, and improving and advancing, that power could be projected using a number of non-traditional uh, techniques. Yes, uh, nation states still have armies and still build strong defense systems and project power through military presence abroad. Uh, yes, uh, nation states engage in the development of weapons, whether they be conventional weapons uh, or weapons used to uh, potentially for a nuclear conflict or even biochemical weapons. But increasingly, we began to see uh, military organizations consider how they could utilize other non-traditional techniques uh, or um, be prepared to defend against non-traditional techniques that could be used by a foreign nation state or an adversary in particular uh, in a manner that supports or projects or helps them to achieve their geopolitical objectives. It doesn't use or require the use of conventional uh, armed conflict or, or conventional military to military interactions. And that's where a term uh, that's, that began to evolve over the last decade or so as hybrid warfare. And let me just be really clear. I'm not talking about asymmetric warfare, warfare which involves the use of force using non-traditional sort of conflict strategies. I'm talking about the use of uh, economic tools, uh, information tools, um, emerging technologies, uh, strategies intended to influence uh, sub, you know, the use of non-military type strategies and techniques in order to project power and achieve uh, geopolitical objectives. And as we began to enter into the digital age and increasingly we began to experience um, cyber attacks and cyber intrusions and data extraction through cyber intrusions and, and, and the use by state actors and non-state actors of uh, cyber attacks to, to disrupt the operations and information systems and, and even systems that run um, physical uh, capabilities such as the banking system. Uh, the military community and the defense community really uh, heightened its focus on this concept of hybrid warfare. And what hybrid warfare essentially is, is the simultaneous use of a variety of methods by an adversary, state and now non-state, that target vulnerabilities, both hard and soft, uh, while uh, remaining under the threshold uh, of, uh, of armed military conflict. So it can include coordinated military, political, economic, civilian and informational instruments of power. But again, it's the use of these non-traditional military techniques in the projection of power for the purposes of achieving geopolitical um, objectives. So for example, under the concept of hybrid warfare, if I wanted to weaken an organization like NATO, uh, because I believe that from my perspective, whatever country I am representing, NATO represented a threat to my security or represented an impediment to my ability to achieve my geopolitical objectives. One way to, um, to challenge NATO would be through armed conflict, but another way would be to use information warfare 
and other types of techniques to disrupt the relationships of NATO, to destabilize the countries that comprise NATO, to undermine the relationship of key NATO allies, to disrupt their activity to communicate through information systems, to undermine the credibility um, and confidence in those information systems. Two very different techniques, but the objective of those techniques could be the same. So what's different today than say five, 10 years ago is this concept of hybrid warfare or hybrid threats has expanded beyond the military or the defense community and has now entered into the law enforcement uh, or become topics of consideration within the law enforcement, counterterrorism, and counterintelligence uh, communities. And today, we're seeing a broad range of uh, threat-related activities being conducted by state and non-state actors, a broad range of illicit activities that are being uh, engaged in by transnational criminal organizations and domestic criminal organizations that are leveraging this, that are very hybrid, have evolved in nature, and very different uh, than what we confronted even five or 10 years ago. And that requires a change in the way that our law enforcement, counterintelligence, and counterterrorism communities uh, operate uh, so that if they're going to confront these threats. So an example is that if uh, in the past, when I was a police officer and I was working narcotics, typically a drug deal, even a large drug deal, would involve negotiations that occur over uh, a telephone or in person and then the transfer of money for a narcotics product that usually occurred through a meeting. Today, uh, drug traffickers are negotiating on the dark web with potential buyers. Uh, the, the exchange of currency uh, involves cryptocurrencies that are occurring in the dark web, and the product that is, bought, that is acquired by the customer is being shipped through uh, private shipping or even the United States uh, Postal Service. So those interactions and those communications that were a part of the, the drug trafficking transaction that enabled that transaction to take place, but also presented opportunities for interdiction or enforcement action, they're not taking place anymore. Uh, and as we discussed the, the topic of terrorism, uh, what, we'll just, what we'll discuss a little bit is how uh, in the terrorism world, we have seen a significant shift from a, a world that involved primarily the, uh, a focus on uh, organizations where people were recruited uh, and uh, trained uh, and indoctrinated uh, and prepared and then directed to conduct an attack and a series of communications and interactions that occurred during the, that time period um, to an environment where you may have individuals uh, conducting attacks on behalf of a terrorist ideology or even on behalf of a group, uh, independent of that group and without there being any communication or interaction between the attacker uh, and other members of the group. Very different problem uh, for counterterrorism and law enforcement authorities and even our intelligence com community to confront. And I would actually argue that the counterterrorism capabilities that we've built in this country, as robust as they are, um, were never designed to address the problem that we're now confronting. So it requires a change in the way uh, that they operate. So those discussions, the discussions that were taking place primarily in the military and defense communities have now expanded. And you now hear uh, officials in organizations like the Department of Homeland Security using terminologies such as uh, hybrid warfare, hybrid threats. But what that really means, and like anything else in government, uh, definitions can, in some cases, vary uh, based on the individuals or organizations that are using them. But what it basically means, without using the term hybrid threat, is we've experienced this dramatic revolution or evolution uh, in the threats uh, that are facing the United States. And in large part, threats, traditional threats, terrorism, threats from foreign nation states, have been dramatically altered uh, because of the uh, emergence of and development of uh, communications technology, social media, and other uh, online uh, tools that allow for communication in a different way uh, than, say, even uh, five or ten years ago. So, so let's talk a little bit about social media in general, um, because um, it, it really is at the heart of this evolution of the threat. 
uh, social media and internet-based communication platforms have, have really come to influence every aspect of our life. Whether it's the way we communicate with people, we share ideas with people, um, we obtain information. Um, you know, when I when I teach my classes, uh, when I've been teaching my classes, you know, one of the first questions is where do they get their information um, about current events and the overwhelming majority of my students over the last several years have told me that they don't read the newspaper. They generally don't even watch um, you know, cable news stations or network news. They get most of their uh, news from social media feeds, Facebook, uh, Messenger, uh, or other social media platforms. And they get most of their information either from sources that they believe are like-minded uh, and have viewpoints or express viewpoints that are consistent uh, with what their viewpoints are, are or um, from people that they know, people they work with, family members, friends, and others. So, but the point here is that social media and other online tools have dramatically altered our society. Uh, not only in the way that we communicate and interact with people, but the way we shop, the way we, um, the way we engage in commerce, the way we think. But just as it has influenced, for the better, some would argue, uh, huge parts of our society, it has also influenced um, the way that criminals, uh, non-state actors such as terrorist groups and foreign intelligence services operate. So some examples of that. Um, when I was a police officer working gangs in Los Angeles, if a gang member wanted to threaten the mem a member of another gang, they would spray paint their moniker on a, on a building, on the wall of a building, or a brick wall someplace in the city, they would cross that name out and they would put the numbers 187 next to it. 187 is the penal code section in California for homicide. And what that message basically said is, hey, you know, we're going to kill you. Um, you're a target for our gang. And after a period of time, a gang member uh, who was the, from the same gang as that which was being threatened would see that spray painted sign uh, and they'd go back and tell uh, his colleagues or her colleagues about uh, the threat. And there would be a series of interactions between the gangs that very often would lead to a homicide or, or drive-by shooting or some other type of technique. Today, they're not doing that. Today, gangs have their own Facebook pages or are using other types of social media platforms. They will post a threat. They're being followed by other gangs who will see that threat. Um, when an act of violence occurs, it will be videotaped, live streamed, um, and videotaped and posted or live stream or reference uh, through other types of social media activity. It will elicit an immediate response um, by those who were the victims of the, the initial act. Um, and then uh, it'll turn into what has been described by law enforcement officials I've talked to as a spasm of activity. Where you'll have a series within a very compressed time frame of violent interactions between these two rival gangs fueled in large part and documented in large part by materials that are posted uh, into social media environment. Another way that social media has influenced um, sort of general behavior as it relates to crime is that people de increasingly are not calling 911 when they witness a crime. Increasingly, they are videotaping or, or, or live streaming what they're witnessing and posting it online or they're writing a post or tweeting um, about what they're, witnessing, what they're witnessing. There was an example at, at Candlestick Park several years back where uh, the fan from one team was involved in a violent confrontation with the fans from another team. It turned into a fight in the restroom, spilled out into a portion of the stadium and then um, continued on in the parking lot of the, um, of the stadium. Uh, no one called 911, but because police were monitoring um, social media activity within a geographic proximity of that stadium, they not only became aware of the incident and were able to respond, but they were able to acquire information and evidence that allowed them um, to, uh, to identify the perpetrators and ultimately to arrest the perpetrator. As I referenced a little bit er earlier, uh, we are seeing an increase in mass casualty attacks in this country. Um, the, the overwhelming majority of these attacks are committed by people who uh, either self-connect with some uh, ideological cause or who um, formulate some personal grievance. 
much of this process of either grievance formulation or self-connection with the cause occurs online. These people tend to view um, large amounts of uh, information regarding past attacks or material posted by extremist groups uh, or other violent material. Um, and then they go out and conduct a mass casualty attack. And just prior to the attack, in almost every single case, um, they tend to post information um, that may uh, reflect an interest in committing an act of violence. I also mentioned earlier, uh, we're seeing a shift uh, in drug traffickers who are beginning increasingly to conduct illegal nego uh, negotiations and, and tra transactions in support of illegal drug, um, the drug trade over the dark web, stripping, uh, excuse me, exchanging cryptocurrencies for illegal drugs like, like fentanyl. Uh, we've also seen uh, flash mobs and instances of civil unrest, in some cases that are inspired by disinformation that's being posted uh, online by either uh, anarchist groups or uh, domestic extremist organizations or even foreign intelligence services. But the point is that these, these events, these protests that turn violent, this violent activity, the civil unrest is being inspired, managed, uh, and controlled um, or, or inspired, organized, and managed um, through the use of these types of technologies. So again, the, the idea of infiltrating an undercover officer into an organizational meeting to acquire you know, in, you know, internal information about a group like the Ku Klux Klan or some other um, violent organization, those meetings aren't necessarily taking place anymore. So it was once believed that cyberspace, or that which occurred in the digital street, um, was simply a reflection, uh, what a, you know, a reflection of what occurred in the physical world. It wasn't different, it was just a reflection. But what we've come to learn uh, is that the digital and physical worlds have become intertwined. And we can no longer view them as separate environments. And, when, and this is particularly important when we're thinking about countering specific threat vectors. When we're looking at countering the intelligence activities of a foreign government, when we're looking at countering uh, the efforts of an international terrorist organization or a domestic uh, extremist organization, when we're looking at trying to interdict drugs that are being trafficked to the United States, we can no longer ignore the fact that many of the pre-incident indicators and many of the key behaviors um, that we need to zero in on so that we can uh, disrupt the activities of these uh, threat or uh, illicit actors uh, is occurring in the digital world. So these two worlds have become intertwined. What we're still struggling with is how to actually incorporate those worlds together because um, one, there are technology issues uh, and it, requ it requires that law enforcement uh, and um, intelligence organizations have the ability to leverage advanced computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning tools uh, in a way that allows them to detect anomalies within the digital environment. We know the language uh, that, uh, that threat actors may be using when conversing over these platforms. We actually have a lot of information and intelligence regarding the personas uh, that are associated with, with threat actors. But the, the challenge is, how do you make available through fund, you know, as well as funding uh, and, and, and other resource acquisition activities, how do, you make the, how do you make technologies that allow law enforcement and intelligence organizations the ability to see into this broad range, this, this huge amount of information that exists in cyberspace? And how do you allow them, more importantly, to do it in a way that does not infringe upon protected speech and other constitutional protections? Because so much of what social media and these other online tools are intended to do is to foster speech, to foster communication. And as all of you know, in our system, particularly here in the United States, in our system, you can have extreme thoughts. You can express those extreme thoughts. You can either, you can express hateful um, thoughts. What you can't do is uh, conduct acts of violence or engage in acts of violence in furtherance of those thoughts or those extremist viewpoints. And that, so it's not simply a question of access to information, it's building 
within those technical capabilities and within the operational frameworks for these police officers or, or counterterrorism officials, the ability to search, protect free speech, but identify pre-incident indicators occurring within cyberspace, within the social media environment um, that are indicative of potential um, violent or, or broad, more broadly criminal activity. And secondly, it's not just detecting what's occurring in cyberspace, but it's how do you evaluate those behaviors you uncover and evaluate them within the broader context of other behaviors that may be exhibited by the same, same individual or groups of individuals. So there are technology challenges, there are operational challenges, there are analytic challenges, and there certainly are challenges that are associated with um, constitutional protections, particularly those that focus on free speech, but I would even argue search and seizure, um, that add tremendous complication to the ability of a government entities to um, address the threats as they're evolving. So three key questions are being considered broadly from a public policy perspective, but, uh, but also from an operational perspective. Um, one, how has social media changed the way criminals, terrorists, violent extremists, and foreign nation state intelligence services behave? How should law enforcement and national security professionals adapt their efforts as a result of the, these changes in behavior? And can expanded use of technological tools that allow law enforcement and intelligence professionals to search social media content, content detect illicit or threat-related activity be conducted in a manner that protects free speech and privacy? Those are the three really core questions that are being considered at the highest levels of our national security community at the federal level, but even being considered by major cities and other law enforcement agencies across the country. So let's talk, take a few minutes and talk about a, a two specific examples and how social media has changed specifically the threat uh, facing the United States. If we go back to the attacks of September 11th, 2001, um, most serious terrorist attacks uh, engaged against the United States, uh, close to 3,000 people were killed by a coordinated attack that was occurred by an, organ an international terrorist organization known as Al Qaeda. The, for the purposes of this discussion, the, the, the key issue to consider is that Al Qaeda at that time was a centralized organization, very structured command and control structure. If there was a leader of the organization, the, the, the leader of the organization, Osama bin Laden, was supported by a Shura Council, which is essentially his board of directors. All operations by elements of the organization had to be approved by the leadership, and individuals were recruited um, to be uh, the operators who conducted the operation. Um, and they were trained, uh, they were deployed, uh, they were overseen by the leadership of the centralized organization. Over time, in large part because of the actions taken by the United States to go after this terrorist organization, this, this, this organization that was once a, 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 a centralized organization uh, developed a series of relationships with regional or terrorist organizations in various parts of the globe. They essentially sold their brand to these regional organizations, entered into an agreement with these organizations that, yes, you can continue your regional objectives, but we want you to be a part of the Al-Qaeda brand and to adopt our more global um, philosophy and our more global objectives. Uh, but the main point here is you go from a single centralized organization to a series of decentralized uh, groups uh, that still operated in a similar manner, meaning uh, they uh, developed plans, they had a defined leadership structure that was responsible for approval of plans uh, and the uh, implementation of the plan. They recruited individuals primarily through, uh, faith, through physical contact. Um, recruits were, would travel, would ultimately be trained, um, were heavily indoctrinated uh, and assigned um, um, operation. And the key was that there was communication that occurred throughout this entire process. There were communications that occurred through the use of email, through cell phones, through satellite phones, through other types of communication, but it was potential operators communicating with other members of a known or suspected terrorist organization. I'm sorry, uh, individuals communicating with other members of a terrorist organization. And those communications, those interactions, the travel of those individuals 
provided U.S. counterterrorism intelligence community or the military uh, opportunities to identify operatives, to identify location of key targets, and then through the use of special operations uh, or, um, or other covert operation capabilities, the ability to take action to uh, disrupt the operations of these organizations to Today, the threat we face in this country is very different. Uh, yes, there are still terrorist organizations out there. Yes, there are still terrorist organizations that continue or have an interest in targeting the U U.S. and U.S. interests abroad. But an additional element of the threat involves the conduct of terrorist-like attacks, mass casualty attacks, whether they use guns or bombs or cars or knives, by individuals who self-connect with the cause of a terrorist group or a domestic extremist organization, um, primarily based on what they see online. Uh, they then, uh, independent of that group, plan, prepare for, and ultimately seek to conduct attacks on behalf of the cause, but again, independent of the organization. So in many respects, the communications, the travel, the interactions that we depended on with our intelligence community and our counterterrorism community depends on in order to detect uh, individuals who are potentially associated with terrorist organizations or specific threats, those interactions, those communications are no longer taking place. So I can be sitting in my house uh, here in Maryland. Uh, I can go online and I can look at content that's been posted by terrorist groups themselves, extremist organizations, or just individuals, and I can I become inspired, indoctrinated, and committed to a cause, um, and uh, then ultimately go out and conduct a mass casualty attack on behalf of that cause without ever communicating or interacting with another person. And the terrorist groups know that, and they've known that now for some time. So in addition to their traditional recruitment techniques, terrorist organizations like ISIS in particular, um, but also Al-Qaeda affiliates have have engaged in robust usage of social media platforms, uh, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, uh, Telegram, um, Instagram, to not only communicate or, or, or spread their extremist ideological materials, but they've developed materials that are specifically intended to inspire or influence the behavior of a vulnerable subset of our population. So what do I mean by that? Um, as we have looked at attacks over the past five years in this country, putting aside the motive behind the attack, whether it was somebody conducting the attack in furtherance of an extremist or terrorist ideology, or someone who was simply doing it in furtherance of some personal grievance. Analysis by the FBI and the United States, the United States Secret Service uh, has Indica indicates that these people share a number of common behavioral uh, and psychological characteristics. These tend to be disaffected, mentally unwell individuals who have, in their, from their perspective, lived a life full of failure. Uh, they don't feel connected to society. Uh, they, are, they feel that they've the victim, that in, in a sense, their failure is a result of them not being given a fair shake. Uh, and they eventually gravitate towards the use of violent attacks as a way to feel not only a social connection with the group that they're conducting the attack on behalf of, uh, but also in a perverse way, a sense of accomplishment. We know these people uh, tend to spend an incredible amount of time online shopping around and viewing material until they find either an ideological cause or, or some personal or public grievance that, that resonates with them. But what we've also seen in intelligence you know, that we've collected sort of bears this out, that terrorist groups have, have adjusted or adapted their um, online material to, to resonate with this subset of our population. Or put a different way, they are specifically targeting with their social media activity individuals in our society who are vulnerable to being influenced by online material. They're out there searching, so the terrorist groups 
will give them the material that they know is going to resonate. And this is this is particularly uh, stepped up in the time in which ISIS has lost control of so much of its territory in Syria and Iraq, because ISIS leadership understands that while they may have in their mind temporarily lost physical control of territory, that they still retain control of territory and cyberspace. And so we've seen intensive efforts by groups like ISIS to use social media platforms to spread their messaging. And based on recent testimony by the FBI, um, and our other intelligence chief, we are seeing a growing number of terrorism investigation and terrorist or acts in this country or mass casualty attacks in this country being conducted not by people who have been recruited um, and, and sent to a training camp, trained and dispatched on a mission, but by people who uh, are self-connecting with these extremist or terrorist causes and who on their own, independent of the group, um, elect to conduct a, a violent attack. Now, obviously the methods of attack have, ch have changed in this environment as well. Um, you know, we've moved away from the use of complex, well-planned attacks that take sometimes years uh, to be pulled together and, and, and implemented uh, to attacks uh, the FBI and the Secret Service call it flash the bang, um, the period of flash the bang, which generally means uh, the period of time that an angry individual goes from being angry to mobilizing and conducting attack. That can be a matter of days, weeks, or months. So what we're talking about are disaffected, vulnerable people who are influenced by extremist or terrorist materials that are posted online, who then self-connect with that cause, elect to go out and conduct an act of violence, plan for that attack primarily through um, in their house, through their computer, or in the local environment. They spend very little time going out uh, and conducting other type of pre-incident activities or pre-attack activities that we generally look for, like surveillance. Um, and instead, they're using tools online like Google Earth or other um, uh, information they can acquire online in order to plan the attack, acquire materials, and conduct the attack. So I think what you can see is that this is a very different dynamic than what we're used to dealing with. We're not going to be picking up uh, communications, uh, whether they be by phone or online or through email, between potential recruits in this country uh, and other members of a terrorist organization or with other known or suspected terrorists. We're not going to see the same types of travel. We're not going to um, see people going to training camps and and be able to use satellite imaging of, 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 of those camps that hopefully identify the individual. The, the provision of materials are going to be through different networks. Um, so a lot of the activities that we have organized are detection and interdiction or mitigation activities. Um, those activities just simply are not occurring. Now, that said, I've done quite a bit of work done uh, developing prevention strategies and prevention frameworks intended to stop these types of attacks. So what are some of the things that federal and state and local authorities are doing? Well, one, we know that these people spend a lot of time online, not only consuming material, but also transmitting or posting material. And we know that they tend to post in such a way that they engage in something called leakage. Uh, which is the articulation of intent to conduct some type of uh, violent or illicit act. So educating members of the public to recognize these types of online activities is important. But these people also exhibit activities in the time period leading up to the attack, which are often um, noted by family members, friends, co co-workers, even other students. And in particular, as you get closer to the time of the attack, they engage in behaviors that very often are reported to police. Now, what this also requires, what it also requires to stop these attacks is police and our federal authorities thinking differently about how they assess the risk posed by an individual um, who may be um, traveling down the path of violence. And more and more uh, organizations are, are adopting a threat management approach, which means law enforcement, uh, engaging in what is known as a threat um, assessment investigation, which is assessing the risk posed by an individual. 
if a traditional technique um, for disruption and law enforcement action can't be taken because it's too early on in the planning process, then a number of local jurisdictions Often techniques that use non law enforcement tools to stop the attack from occurring. My main point here is that the type of the mass casualty threat facing the country has evolved. It's evolved primarily because of information that's available through online resources. Uh, and therefore, our law enforcement, counterterrorism communities are adapting so they're better able to confront this threat. Let me really quickly talk about. Um, because um, I see the time is um, moving by quickly, about how foreign intelligence services are using social media. Um, I'm sure that everybody has heard about the Mueller report and about concerns that have been raised by our intelligence officials, uh, the investigation by Robert Mueller, uh, even congressional investigation that Russia sought to influence the outcome of the 2016 presidential election. And the way they sought to do that uh, was through a, a, a variety of strategic or they used cyber penetration uh, and were able to gain access to sensitive information um, within them, uh, within political parties and campaign committees. They were able to use they weaponize that information uh, and strategically use uh, entities such as WikiLeaks uh, to uh, post or to disseminate uh, embarrassing information. Uh, intended to influence the elected environment. But they also, um, they also sought to uh, penetrate election systems, particularly voter registration systems. And it's unclear at this point whether they actually were able to manipulate any of the data, but they were able to gain access into a number of um, registration systems. And now it appears based on some of the findings of the Mueller investigation that they're actually able to enter into or introduce malware into some of the systems used by uh, counties uh, that were involved in the vote tabulation. Um, but what they also did, which I think uh, is actually a, a more significant um, element of the threat, is they engaged in a comprehensive, systemic, uh, and widespread disinformation campaign um, with the objective to uh, influence voter opinion about public policy issues, to uh, influence in a positive way voters' opinion on presidential candidate Donald Trump and to depress turnout and to decrease support for his opponent at the time, Hillary Clinton. Now, a lot of people tend to look at the, the efforts by Russia in the 2016 election as a single operation. Actually, that's not correct. Uh, what Russia did in 2016 and what they continue to do today is part of a systematic effort by Russia to achieve a number of, of objectives as it relates to the United States. One, they're seeking to sow discord. They're seeking to inflame tensions, uh, polarize our society, uh, to destabilize our society by basically turning uh, Americans against themselves. They're seeking to undermine credibility and confidence in our government systems. They want the general public in the United States, they want the political apparatus in the United States, but they also want our foreign partners and adversaries, or our foreign partners and allies, excuse me, um, to be less confident and therefore less willing uh, to uh, operate with our intelligence professionals or intelligence organizations and our enforcement. They are seeking to disrupt our relationship with our key allies, whether it be the European Union or NATO. And as they are targeting the US through these disinformation efforts, um, they, are, um, they are also targeting uh, the, the, the systems in the, or the political system in countries like France, Belgium, Germany, uh, the UK. What their objective is, uh, is to uh, undermine the integrity of, of NATO. Why are they doing that? Because NATO, in their mind, stands in the way of, of Russia achieving its own geopolitical objectives. So if NATO is weakened, if NATO uh, isn't as formidable as a force that can counteract Russian efforts, then Russia is in a stronger position to achieve its geopolitical objectives. The final thing, um, and this is sort of an emerging element of, of Russia's disinformation efforts, is they are not only seeking 
to disrupt uh, discord or to, to sow discord through disruptive debate in this country, but now to influence um, civil unrest and violent behavior. So there's a direct connection with some of these Russian personas that were created um, during these disinformation efforts with um, racist uh, and uh, white supremacist and uh, material that is being posted online, and in some cases has been used as the justification for mass casualty attacks by individuals um, in the United States. So the point is that through these disinformation efforts, they're not seeking simply to interfere in our political process or, or interfere in a certain election or even support the activities of a specific political candidate, but they're using these same social media tools um, in order, in a very widespread way, um, to uh, disrupt, destabilize, uh, and, um, and create polarization uh, within our society. It, it's been projected that through their activities in this disinformation campaign, they were able to touch and therefore potentially influence the attitudes and opinions of millions and millions of people across this country. And in some cases, they, were, uh, they would send messaging out on a widespread basis. And in other cases, they would micro-target their um, disinformation campaigns. So in the Mueller investigation, and if you haven't had a chance to read all 400 plus pages, I really would encourage you to do so because Robert Mueller goes into great detail about how they were able to use information they acquired through hacks or through other interactions with people in the United States to identify voter turnout strategies and key districts in which voter turnout was essential, they then targeted their disinformation efforts to impact that voter turnout in those areas. And so while there's no information to date that reflects that they were able to successfully hack into a voter system um, and manipulate vote tallies, there is plenty of information and evidence that reflects that they have been able to influence public opinion. And I would just leave you with the thought that to manipulate the outcome of an election, one can either hack into voter systems and manipulate vote tabulation, or they can use misinformation to influence the opinion of a voter before they walk into a voting room. So if I can either convince somebody to vote a certain way by spreading inaccurate information, or I can depress voter turnout by, by spreading within a specific ethnic community um, misinformation about a candidate, therefore making them not wanting to go out and vote. Or I can send out on a widespread basis inaccurate information about when polling places are open or when people can vote, the outcome of an election. And so our intelligence chiefs are very clear that Russia's efforts, particularly on the disinformation front, um, continue. They were, uh, they were widespread during the 2016 election. They continue through the 2018 election. They continue today, and they expect them to be ongoing uh, through the 2020 election. We also um, have noted that other nation states, China, North Korea, Iran in particular, have acknowledged the success of Russia's efforts and they are increasingly beginning to employ these types of techniques. Finally, um, we're still struggling a little bit at a national level uh, in figuring out how to deal with, in particular, the disinformation campaign efforts. So as we get into the fall, we begin having these discussions during the semester, I think a lot of the attention will focus on what more this country can do, both government and non-government entities, and in fact, the general public as well, but that's a big part of it in order to counteract these disinformation efforts. I'll just leave you with two thoughts, and then we'll open up for a few minutes for some questions if there's still time. Uh, one, our founding fathers um, believed that the greatest threat to this country is if a foreign government were able to acquire control or gain influence over our government leaders. Uh, and it is exactly what our foreign adversaries today are seeking to do. It's not that disinformation campaigns are a new idea. They've been going on for decades, and they've been, it's a technique that's been used by intelligence services for generations. What's different today is 
the ability using technology of these same intelligence services to influence a broad range of individuals or a very targeted group of individuals. Finally, if any of you out there are, are like my students um, that I've been had the honor to, to work with over the last several years, and you get most of your information through social media, you are you have probably received disinformation from a foreign intelligence service. So my advice to y'all is be skeptical about what you see on social media. Always look for source, original source material. Be curious, be cynical, uh, and be suspicious. And with that, Jordan, I'll turn it over to you for, uh, for any questions. All right, folks, so we have about 10 minutes. Um, it looks like for some reason, at least on my version of Zoom, the raise hand feature has disappeared. Um, these are those hiccups that I mentioned with our um, first Zoom chat. So if you have the ability to rate, click a raise hand button next to your name, uh, go ahead and do so. Otherwise, um, just put something in the chat to let me know that you have a question and I will unmute you. You can also, if you don't have a microphone that works or if you prefer not to use it, feel free to type a question in the chat and I will ask it on your behalf. Who wants to be first? Wow, no questions. Apparently you did a great job. There we go. All right, so for the sake of um, folks who will be watching the recording and not able to see the chat, um, can you speak a little about deep fakes and the threat that they pose to US national security interests? Um, what can we do to combat this issue? Yeah, that's a great question because when I reference disinformation campaigns, uh, they take several forms. And just for the purpose of, if, if you don't know what a deep fake is, a deep fake is the use of um, video type technology in order to create videos that um, are fake. Meaning you can essentially, um, someone could take this video and could have me, you know, singing an opera and it would look like I was sitting here online for an hour singing an opera on behalf of CSS and SSD. Um, and because we've moved so far into the digital environment, what, use, what activity that used to be pretty easy for people to detect through analysis is much more difficult. And you know, because information and videos can go viral so quickly, that a deep fake can be Put out there, uh, it can look real and be spread not only amongst ten, you know, thousands of people, but millions of people uh, in a matter of hours. Um, so, a couple examples. Uh, during the, the last election cycle, there was a senator who gave a speech, um, and an individual in this country um, put together a video that made it sound like this senator was saying, um, "We uh, people people focus too much on 9/11. It wasn't that big of a deal." And that's not what he said, but that um, video was posted by um, a, a, a more extreme political entity in this country. It was then picked up by a series of Russian, by a Russian entity that used its bots and online personas to amplify that message where millions of people within a matter of hours were looking at a video that was fake. There was a, recently a video that was posted showing the Speaker of the House, and it had been manipulated to make it appear that she was speaking in a way that was consistent with being drunk. And the suggestion was, is that either she had had some type of cerebral accident or that she was drunk. Um, again, uh, before, uh, you know, too long, that video was being viewed by millions of people. So the concern is that these highly realistic videos that are manufactured uh, either to annoy or embarrass or by foreign intelligence services in furtherance of a disinformation campaign will not only be put out there, but will be spread wide in a very widespread manner. Um, and that makes, makes addressing or correcting that information difficult. So what people are struggling with right now is how do you solve that problem? If I create a, a video of, you know, of, a, of a presidential candidate uh, saying, you know, he hates people of a certain ethnicity or color, uh, and he, you know, he 
and, and says other outrageous things, even if he never said it, it's going to appear in a realistic way that they did, and it will go viral before someone can fact check. So it's a real concern. And you know, I think part of it is the same way that we would analyze sort of analog imaging or film for to see if the photographs have been modified, we need to use advanced computing, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning to be able to detect within the digital footprint of these uh, images, um, those that are deep fakes. And then we need, and this is broadly a challenge with disinformation campaigns, we need to figure out what is the entity in the federal government that's gonna know that that's occurred and how is, the, how is that entity gonna reach out to the public to educate them? Because it's not going to work relying on the social media. In fact, in the case that I just described, uh, one of the social media platforms still has that video post. Uh, you're muted. Thank you, John. Uh, next question. Um, let's, given the current status of both recruitment and disinformation online, what do you think this environment will look like in the future as these trend lines continue? Um, I think we're going to continue to see an increase in mass casualty attacks in this country by the groups of offenders that I described. Uh, and unless we take steps relatively quickly to begin educating and establishing threat management capabilities across the country, uh, that those increases will continue uh, in, in a very expansive way. Not to be depressing. <laughs> um. The topic as a whole, it can be a little depressing. Um, you mentioned that domestic terrorists are becoming increasingly decentralized, picking up info and aid online rather than traveling abroad, for example. Is this a sign that they're on the back foot, especially since self taught terrorists are prone to making mistakes? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I think there's a tendency in the intelligence community in particular for people to say, well, this means that, you know, they're on the run or that we're making progress. Um, what I've come to learn after 35 years is threats evolve and they adapt. And you can make progress in one area, but then you need to adapt to the problem as it has changed. So clearly we have made tremendous progress targeting um, ISIS as an organization, particularly in the areas where they held territory in Syria and Iraq. Uh, we have extensive operations that are going on in Africa and the Middle East and other parts of the world where we're targeting terrorist leaders and terrorist organizations. You know, Al-Qaeda has been on the run. Um, but as with all terrorist and extremist organizations, they will evolve. And while we may not see the same um, sophistication in attacks by terrorist, international terrorist organizations in particular, we probably are going to see an increase in um, less sophisticated, but mass casualty attacks in this country as well. Um, so it just means that, you know, I don't typically tend to look at the world as they're on their back foot, they're, or, or, or we're winning over here. That may be great, but we just have to adapt to how the techniques are changing. And just not to make everybody depressed, I will say we've made a lot of progress in this country um, in not only learning about the characteristics of these attackers, but also figuring out ways to stop these attacks. And there have been a series of attacks that have actually been stopped um, because people picked up activity online, they reported it to law enforcement, law enforcement uh, was able to do the type of assessment they need to do and were able to uh, take steps to prevent an attack from occurring. So what if we can, at the national level, um, put some energy into expanding those capabilities, um, you know, my dire predictions of an expansion of these types of attacks uh, would probably uh, be reversed if we'd see it All right, we've got two more questions in the chat right now, which is probably all we have time for. Um, first one, does the U.S. need a unique and separate intelligence agency to handle cyber and information warfare? If not, what agency or agencies should take the lead on this? Yeah, you know, that's an excellent question. Um, and I'll go back to something that I said earlier. My we used to treat cybersecurity and cyber activities as something separate from uh, threat-related activities in the physical world. And you know, we do have organizations such as U.S. Cyber Command uh, that are highly proficient and 
very much targeted on certain types of behavior that occur in the online environment. I think where the challenge lies, though, is, is that if these two worlds are coming together, does it make it more difficult if you have an organization that simply exists and focuses on that which occurs in the digital world, and they operate separately from um, the, you know, the organizations that target or work with threats that occur in the physical world? Now, for those of you who are alumni and who work in the intelligence community, um, you know, you're not going to be surprised by what I'm going to say. The challenge here is getting these organizations who have these unique capabilities and different um, focus areas to come together. And I've always believed you organize around what your analysis tells you the threat uh, is organized as. And if you have a threat that has both a cyber and a, uh, a physical element to it, the challenge is making sure that the coordination and collaboration is occurring. So the skill sets that exist across you know, the intelligence community, for example, have be become better integrated. So dealing with the issue of disinformation, for example, because I see that's one of the next questions, um, so I can blend right into that, is what it requires is a integrated and coordinated approach. First, you have to protect it. That means using advanced technology that operate within the social media environment in the digital space uh, in order to identify suspicious indicators or anomalous or threat related activities and then the use of various tools um, in order to mitigate that in some cases it may mean offensive operations leveraging cyber command taking out servers you know um, detecting and taking out individuals who may be actually online personas taking out you know bot networks um, but it may also mean reaching out to those who are receiving and being influenced by that um, misinformation, whether it be a private sector entity, a political campaign, um, or the public in general. I will say though, the question that was posted uh, makes a very good point. Part of the problem in dealing with disinformation is that it works. And people who benefit from misinformation efforts Tend, not want, tend to not want to support efforts to stop misinformation. So, you know, if you have one political party that says, if I learn that I'm leveraging misinformation, I'm not going to amplify it. And you have another political party that says, hey, if it benefits me, I'm going to use it. Then it's going to make it very difficult for our intelligence and governmental entities responsible for protecting us from foreign influence to be successful. All right, thank you all for your wonderful questions and for staying on um, throughout this hour and testing out our very first virtual uh, speaker series. We will have more coming up being announced shortly. Keep an eye on your um, or alumni emails, depending on what your affiliation is. Um, we will be announcing those very soon. Um, and a big thank you to John um, for a very wonderful discussion as well as for being our guinea pig with this um, experiment. Thank you. Very much. All right, everybody, have a good night. <laughs>